Hi, this is Matthew Robert Payne. We're going to call this Keys to Revelation, Visions and Encounters. This is a continuation of going deeper in the Gospels. And if you press on Matthew Robert Payne underneath this video, you can go to my homepage and see a whole playlist of messages that are getting taken out of the Gospels and diving deeper than you may have heard the Gospels taught at. A deeper revelation, a deeper understanding of some of the teachings that are found in the Gospels. And I can imagine in years to come that this is going to be, oh, well, in you know, six months or however long it takes me to go through the whole of all the Gospels and everything that Jesus taught, I can imagine that it's going to be a very long playlist, very exciting. The people, the five or six friends of mine that are following all the teachings are really enjoying themselves. So I encourage you, if you see this on YouTube, uh, subscribe to my channel, go to that playlist and start to hear some revelation and some teaching in the Gospels through me in a way that you may never have heard before. And uh, I, I promise you that my teachings will be full of my life, full of testimony and full of mis me throwing myself under the bus and sharing unflattering accounts of my life to better demonstrate uh, the teachings found in the Word of God. If uh, you're one of my regular listeners, welcome. <laughs> and uh, I hope you keep up with uh, my teachings. Okay, we're going to take it from Matthew 7. And uh, it, uh, we're going to take up from verse 6. I'm going to read it. Then I'm going to unpack it a little bit. And this video is going to pretty well go for as long as it takes me. Uh, to say what I feel led to say. It could be half an hour, it could be an hour. I don't know how long it is because I seem to get led by the Holy Spirit in what I'm going to say and I don't plan uh, what I'm going to say many times. I just speak until the message is finished. So verse number six says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, the first before it is just saying, first hypocrite, remove the plank from your own eye, then you'll see clearly, remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so then it moves on, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast... And it's like it's a transition, okay? He's starting a new subject. First, he's talking about do not judge people and, um, you know, don't, don't judge or, you know, people. Don't judge people self-righteously or how you're judging them self-righteously will happen back to you. And uh, so, um, you know, uh, I'm going to pick that up because uh, with my further revelation and understanding of these verses, um, we'll, we'll come back to what he's talking about that and maybe put more contextual understanding into those verses about judging based on the subject that we're going to enter. Now, all of my life, all of my life, and especially in the next last 10 years or so, I've been hearing from Jesus and getting revelation out of the Bible from the Holy Spirit and revelation that uh, when the Holy Spirit sort of illuminated the meaning to me, then I'll discuss it back and forth with Jesus. Only uh, over the last couple of years have I been actively being led by the Holy Spirit. These days, all day, I'm directed each day, each hour of the day, with each thing I do and each thing that I do in life, in my life, is directed and led by the Holy Spirit. And in order to walk in the Holy Spirit, you've actually got to crucify and lay down and die to the ways that you would do things. And you've got to instead submit to what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. So if uh, 
I've been up for a long time and it comes time for night time. The Holy Spirit say, I want you to stay up tonight and keep on doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, instead of sleeping tomorrow when it's morning time, I want you to stay up till tomorrow night uh, and keep on doing what I keep you busy doing. Now, being led by the Holy Spirit, getting revelation from the Holy Spirit can get you into a lot of trouble. And all my life, I've been going to churches stupidly sharing what Jesus has told me or what the Holy Spirit has told me about a certain scripture verse. Um, sometimes, many times, most times, when I share what I've been shown, it's so profound, it's so deep, it's so contrary to what other people have heard taught about that scripture that they reject it. They just, you know, they're thinking to themselves, and they don't tell you this, if this is true, everything I've ever heard for the last 20 years as a Christian is wrong. And if this is true, and if I accept this revelation to be true, then this person is right. And look at them. They can't even dress like a professional. They look like a blooming street kid. They look like a homeless kid. He's fat. He's overweight. I know he's got a mental illness because I've talked to him before. And he thinks he's coming out with something that... Uh, the, the church hasn't seen and they haven't seen for many years. And uh, as far as I've known as a Christian, I've never heard anyone say this is the meaning of that scripture. And if he's true, everything I've ever heard is wrong. And this truth supersedes it. So we're basically in disobedience and we're totally wrong. And he's got the answer. Now, instead of them accepting that of an overweight, uh, not very well dressed, not very expensive poor person who seems to have no reputation, no authority, no power, and nothing that is worth knowing or having. Of course, they can't recognise your anointing, can't recognise the power in your life and just see you for this fool that uh, Paul says, you know, God doesn't use the trained and learned people of this world, but he used the foolish and the shameful and the neglected and the rejected to confound the wisdom of the wise, because you're one of those people, one of the fools, rejected, neglected, shamed, unprofitable servants. Because you're one of those people, you never received as a prophet. You're, you're a fool. You're an idiot. You're crazy. You've got a mental illness. You're rejected, despised. You're not one of the worthy and noble or good-looking people like would be a king or a powerful or a rich person, because you're a fool and you're a total reject, we don't have to receive you. But when, when you present as that fool and people can't spiritually discern anointing and power and giftings in a person, because they're not an apostle and they're not a prophet and they can't recognise anointings or giftings, what are they left with? You're coming out with something that's never been heard. So what choice did they have when they hear your revelation? They reject it. Now, some of them will say, the bold ones, the honest ones, the more truthful ones, say, if that is true, you're saying that everything this church has been preaching for the last 10 years is wrong. If that is true, all that I've ever heard on that subject is wrong. And if that's true, we're all wrong and we've been walking in error and things have got to change. Well, I don't think you're wrong. You're a fat, overweight, loser, mentally ill person who's living in delusions. And I've heard stories about some of your prophecies and, you know, I reject it. And, I, I, I you know, if I, I, I don't suggest you really tell that to anyone else because they'll think you're a fool like I do. And I really don't want to talk to anyone. Now, if they've got balls and courage and self-fortitude and they're an honest sort of person, which most Christians are, they'll say that to you. But most people, 99% of people, won't say that to you. They'll just walk away and say, I'm never going to be around him again. He's totally crazy. Right? But if they do speak up, they call you a fool. They'll call you an idiot. The court say, how could you dare say that? You're saying that everything this church preaches is wrong. So I've never been able to do this scripture right. I've never been able to walk in this scripture. Because, 
you know, God has given me a lack of discernment in people and spirits in people. Now, I've got a very strong discernment spirits gift, which also includes being able to see saints, see angels, talk to God, recognise spiritual uh, things and presences and encounters and the spirit on things. I've been able to recognise that, but I've been given no, pretty well no discernment on demons that are actually in specific people. Some people can say that's a religious spirit, that's pride, that's Jezebel, that's this, and I've got this discernment of spirits. Well, I don't have, because I'm just the most loving, accepting, beautiful person that I know, one of the most beautiful people that I know. And, um, and if I knew all that about demons, I'd never talk to people because I'd be worried about, he's prideful, so he's never going to accept. He's a Je she's a Jezebel, she's so full of pride and control and ruling over people. I'm not going to have anything to do with her. I'm never going to talk to her because all Jezebels want to do is draw close to me and start controlling me, using me and abusing me. And every Jezebel I've ever met has hurt me and broken me and hurt me really bad. So if I knew that someone had a Jezebel spirit, I'd have nothing to do with them. So I've just got to be clueless when it comes to demons because, you know, if I'm dealing with pride or Jezebel, I wouldn't want anything to do with them. And so God doesn't give me that part of discernment of spirit. So I can't tell who a dog is or who a swine is. And I've never looked at a person as a dog or a swine. I just accept people and, you know, Peter says that a person who have escaped the corruptions of the world and come out of the world and started to live a holy, set-apart life, serving Jesus and not the lust of the flesh in the world and all the world has to offer. If a person comes out of that, gets in the church, gets some false teaching from, by some prosperity teachers and starts getting into the lust of the flesh and the best clothes, the best houses, you can be happy and rich and serve the lust of the world and serve God too. In other words, Jesus is wrong. You can serve mammon and you can serve God at the same time and be happy with both. If, if false teachers teach them that and they start to believe that you can serve mammon, money and possessions, and you can serve God and be happy with God, which is the total opposite of what Jesus said you can do, then they'll fall back into lusting and going after the things of the world and having all the best things. And they'll fall into such a covetous lifestyle that they'll reach a, a state of sin that'll remove them from their uh, relationship with God and put them into a backslidden, a backslidden, reprobate, reprobate state that when they die, they'll go to hell. Now, that's not taught by the church. People don't know that up to 50% of born-again Christians are dropping into hell, but Peter calls those people who came out of the world and the things of the world and you know, gave up everything to have for Jesus and then start serving the flesh again and fall back into the world and all the lust of covetousness and sin. Peter calls them dogs and swine. Peter says it's like a dog returns to his vomit and, and the swine returns to the mud shed, you know. And so that's like the prodigal son getting welcomed back by his father and deciding, no, I, I prefer to be in the pig pen and going back into slavery into the pig pen. That's what Peter was saying. He's like a pig that loves mud and gets muddy, right? And, and, and Peter was saying, if you go back into the world and the lust of the flesh, he's saying that it's like a dog likes to go back and eat its vomit. Jesus said, when you're lukewarm and you like all the things of the flesh and you're serving the flesh and you think you're rich and you're not in need of God, which most America is, they've got money, they can buy pills. If they've got this, they've got money, they can do this, they can do this. They don't really need God. They just like the presence of God and praying for God to bless them, but they don't really need God for anything. Money can solve it. And I, they've got so much money that they really haven't got a need to submit to God or do anything God says. But God's okay to praise and think you're in a happy club and, and pray. And, you know, but you can use your money for anything you need. You don't need God. So to the church of Laodicea, he says that you're lukewarm. I wish that your heart, like you once were when you're pursuing Christ and you were hungry, 
or you're cold like a witch and a warlock actively working against the kingdom of God. But because you're a bit of both, a, a bit of God and a bit of the world, and you've got this mix of God and the world, you're lukewarm and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. So vomit's mentioned there. Vomit's mentioned about people who return to the world. And vomit's mentioned when Jesus is talking about these people who've reached a style of Christianity, which most of the church in, in the West has reached, which is lukewarm, not effective, not obedient, not doing anything, trying to serve God and the world, become hot and cold at the same time. They become lukewarm. And Jesus said he'd vomit them out of the mouth. Now, have you ever vomited and gone and said, oh, that's part of me, that's precious, I'll go and put that back in my mouth. If Jesus said he's going to vomit the lukewarm out of his mouth, do you think he's going to go and pick it up and put it back in his mouth? Do you think if you've been vomited out of Jesus' mouth, do you think he's ever going to pick you back up and say, well, he's a son of mine, I love him. I'm never going to leave or, or, or forget him. I'm going to pick him back up and put him back in my mouth because, you know, a Christian definitely can't go to hell. Or do you think if Jesus gets so sick and tired of you that he vomits you out of his mouth and rejects you out of his body, that's what vomit is. It's something that's corrupt that gets rejected out of the body. The body actually spews you up, says this is no good, get rid of it. It's vomiting up stuff that's no good for you. Your body reaches such a state where it says, I don't want this. And often you don't have to vomit or not. Often one, one vomit or two and you're fixed and you're not vomiting. It's not because you've run out of stuff, got rid of the corruption. So Jesus says, when you're lukewarm, you vomit you out of the mouth. Peter says, when you go into the world, become lukewarm, become reprobate and lose your salvation. He says, it's better that you weren't even saved than get saved and become like this. Do you know why it's worse? Do you know why it's worse for a Christian in hell than it is for a non-Christian? Because a non-Christian haven't got verses playing in their mind for eternity saying why they're there. But a Christian has got all these verses playing in the mind, saying scripturally why they're there. You didn't invest your talent, so you've got the gnashing of teeth. You're an unfruitful vine. You went after the goods and the cares of the world and the lust of, the, the, uh, lust of riches, the cares, cares of the world and the lust after riches, that it says that you become unfruitful and choked by the weeds, that most of the church is in that state, the cares of the world and the lust, lust of, of riches, uh, keep them from bearing any fruit. Most Christians don't bear any fruit. So they're at that state. So you've got that verse and you've got 20 or 30 verses playing in your head saying, this is the reason you're here. A non-Christian, just suffering, they're not suffering all these reasons why they're here. They're pretty well saying, well, I pretty much deserve this. I was a real jerk. I really didn't listen to God. I really didn't care about what God had to say. I didn't care about church. I didn't really accept Jesus. Pretty well deserved to be here. But a Christian, you say, I don't deserve to be here. I'm a Christian. And then 20 verses saying, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Scripture after scripture. And I can quote you the 20 scriptures and really annoy you. Right? So... So many Christians are serving the flesh. They've been taught to serve the flesh. They don't walk in the spirit. They don't get revelation of the spirit. Most Christians don't even hear from the Holy Spirit or Jesus. And so, you know, when they hear revelation, Paul says the wisdom of God is foolishness to them. What does he say? He says that in Corinthians, just a bit further on than he says the fools are sent to the world to confound the world. So when they see a fool like me, overweight, like this, fat, Right, but not dressed too well, looking like a homeless person, coming out with something that's total contra controversial and total counter cultural to the culture of their church. When they hear the wisdom of God, the spirit of God coming out of a person and revelation that most Christians don't get because they never get revelation. When they hear the wisdom of God, Paul says the wisdom of God is foolishness to, the, to men. The wisdom of God is foolishness to the carnal-minded. 
So when they hear the wisdom, they reject that and call you a fool. But it takes an overweight person on a disability pension in government sponsored housing to live by that disability pension and an income that he spends all his income and ministry back on books and providing free books. For people. It takes a fool like me to get promoted and promoted and promoted in anointing to be able to sit down and give you an explanation of this that you've never seen before or just on one verse. So who are these swine? Who are these dogs? Well, a dog returns to his vomit, like Peter said, eats up his vomit. So that's a pretty disgusting thing, but dogs do that. And a swine is someone like the prodigal son who's been saved, redeemed, forgiven all of his sins, spends another year or two with the father and says, no, I'm going back to the pig pen. This is all too much. This is all too much hard work. Serving you is too much. I'm going to go back and earn some money out there in the world and spend up my money and go back to the prostitutes and the whores because this is just all too much. This Christian life is just too hard to do. So that would be an explanation. And remember, vomit is talked by Jesus about lukewarm people who really got no idea of the kingdom and taught to have no idea of the kingdom. So these swine and these dogs are people essentially... 70 or 80, 90% of the people that attend church. So with all of that, and I didn't realise this is going to be so long, but like I said, I don't care how long it is. Um, while ever it's good, I'm going to keep on speaking and I'm in a good mood and I've been up for a long time so I can speak in a lot of good mood, right? So this can go as long as I like on this verse and then the next verse and the next verse. So when you come out with revelation, things of spirit, right, Keys to revelation, visions, and encounters. Right? So when you come out with revelations, to the normal carnal-minded Christian who doesn't know how to be directed by the Spirit or taught by the Holy Spirit or even recognises the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, to them, that's foolishness. So if you walk in revelation, encounters, and visions, and the supernatural, don't be going sharing that stuff with people. Only be sharing that stuff with people who are having the same sort of experience or are on the same page as you. So I've got five people, five or six people. I've got Elizabeth, Mary, Dundee, Andy, and, um, and John, who listen to all of my videos and all of my teaching. So they're five friends that are on the same page with me. I have hours and hours of conversation over Facebook phone, free phone with them, talking about my revelations, my life, and they've really proven to be beautiful people, really love and agree with everything I teach, totally on the same page. So Jesus is saying, when you have revelations and encounters and visions and the supernatural life, share it with people that are on the same page with you. They'd accept that you're a true prophet, that you really do want to do it, and they really respect what you teach, and they really wish they had what you have. And all of those five people are going after level after level after level of relationship, getting closer and closer and closer, more and more and more mature and more and more profoundly affected by everything I do and say. And every time I've been promoted in anointing, nine times this year, every month. Every time I've gone up to a higher, higher, higher level, some of these people have been able to name the prophets and name the mantle that I'm starting to move in as I move in them. And they can recognise that 10 days ago, when it turned into September, that I moved to a whole new level. One of the guys, Andy, that comments, and the whole five comment and give me feedback on everything I do, one of them comments said, this is really profound in the Gospels. What you should do is do a series on the Gospels and reteach the Gospels in a way at this level of understanding. And, you know, you can make a whole book on it. Uh, understanding the Gospels is such a profound, is such revelation and knowledge, just moving in a new way. People would really go well learning the Gospels at this stage and level of revelation that you're bringing out right now. So what did I do? 
when this trusted friend, Andy Fabian, who comments on most of my YouTube videos, what did I do when he said to do that? I started to do it. And nearly every day, every second day, I come out with a new teaching on the Gospels, expounding on what's in the Gospels, talking about some things that you may not have ever heard taught about the things that are said in the Gospels. I've got a tremendous, deep, personal relationship with Jesus, a, a relationship that has seen me meet him over 400 times in vision, in heaven, on earth, mostly on earth. Seen him five times in the flesh as a real human being, knowing it was Jesus, knowing it was meeting him five times. And then I met him another three times where he's been in another human that I actually know and have got a relationship, a real human. And that human has gone into a trance and Jesus has talked to me for five minutes, 10 minutes, even half an hour through that human that I trust. And I'm speaking face to face with Jesus in the flesh, but the spirit of Jesus is coming through them. I'm talking to someone I know, a homeless person, who's gone into a trance and doesn't even understand that Jesus is speaking through them, like demons can speak through homeless people and do demonize people all the time. You don't really worry about it. But when Jesus is speaking through a homeless drunk, then you've got an issue with it. Jesus can do whatever he likes. So they're in a trance and I'm having this two-way, face-to-face conversation with Jesus in a body that I really trust. I'll tell you, out of the five times I met Jesus in the flesh, I only talked to him once back and forth. The other four times I was too scared to talk to him, too overcome. I think, if well, I met Jesus in the flesh, I'd talk to him. I bet you don't. I bet you if you start to walk in all this and start to obey everything I teach and you start to manifest and you start to obey Jesus' commands, whether it says in John 14, 21, that if you walk in his commands and you obey him and you get very good at it, he'll manifest himself. He might start manifesting in visions all the time. You do it so well, be so good, so good at the being, so laid down, so obedient, so doing so many things that Jesus tells you to do that he may actually manifest in the flesh and I bet you when he manifests in the flesh I bet you can't have a face-to-face -face conversation with him because you'd be so overcome that you're not even worthy to meet him so to have good conversations and hear him flesh to flesh most of the time he's coming to friends of mine appeared in them put them in a trance and talk to me face to face. And those three occasions was in a homeless person that I already knew, that I already had a relationship with and didn't walk away once I went in the trance because they had no idea they were in the trance. And I'm just talking to Jesus back and forth. And it's really amazing. And I've done that five times to other people. The people that I love, I've had Jesus speak to them face to face through me. In the flesh, but many times over video, Jesus has spoken to one of my friends face to face. And Dundee has experienced that. And that's pretty amazing. So when you share your revelation or your encounter or your visions with a hopeless, disobedient, lukewarm Christian, they're going to call you an idiot or a fool or say you have got no idea. And they will put a spiritual knife through you, like turn on you and turn you and tear you to pieces. So they won't cut you to pieces, right? You know, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces, right? So people don't understand this. Like, who tears you to pieces? What sort of, what is this? Who are these dogs? Who are the swine? And when do you ever have something so holy and so amazing that you shouldn't share it with them? I should, I'll state with this because so many of you are total strangers and it doesn't really worry me. What do you think? That's why I teach so freely on YouTube. Michael lives with me, right? My five friends know that. I don't care. Michael the Archangel is in my house all the time. Now, if you talk to an expert, he's the angel over Israel. He can't leave Israel. 
talk to other people. Who do you think you are? Showing Michael of the archangels in your house, right? That's like sharing something holy with swan. Most people hear that and they just go, whack, I just disagree with everything he's teaching now. This guy is totally crazy. So that's a definition of sharing something holy with swipe, in other words. It's something so, so big, so precious, so amazing, which is precious to you, holy, with people with no understanding who can't receive it. That's what that's basically saying. So keep all your special visions and your special encounters and special revelations that are very precious to you, holy, Keep it to yourself or only share it with people on the same page as you. If you've got a great relationship, they really love you, they really love everything, share your visions, encounters and revelations with them and keep what is precious to you that's going to cut you to pieces if people reject it and say you're a fool or speak 1,500 scriptures into why your revelation is wrong and they can quote 25 scriptures and give you a two and a half hour lecture about how your vision or encounter can't possibly write because these 25 scriptures that I know and I'm a Pharisee and I know all my scriptures and they'll talk you out of it. They'll, they'll actually like bring so many scriptures in on Facebook or YouTube that quote so many scriptures. The more religious they are, the longer their comment is and the more scriptures they use. Right? When I see a long comment, I don't even read it, right? It's so religious, right? So they'll use those scriptures to put knives through you and cut you to pieces and say, you're a total fool, you're a total jerk, you're a total false prophet, you're totally in heresy, you, you've got to come out of your pride, you've got to stop being so self-righteous, you think you're so amazing. Well, you're not. And they'll do their best to tear you to pieces. And you can't even respond to them because you try and enter into the bait. They're so full of self-righteousness. They're so full of judging. They're so full of themselves that it says, for with judgment you judge, you'll be judged, and with the same measure, it'll be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Right? Or how do, can you give, say to your brother, let me remove that speck in your eye and look at the plank in your eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank in your eye, then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. So these religious, perfect, amazing Pharisees that know hundreds and hundreds of scriptures, they'll say, you're delusional, man. You're off pat. You're teaching heresy. And here's 150 scriptures. Why? Right? Do you know what? They've got a big plank in their eye called religion and unbelief and lack of faith and a lack of discernment and a lack of walking in the Holy Spirit. They've been taught by a Baptist or a cessationalist or someone teaches all these doctrines that things that the supernatural don't exist and all this, um, you know, you haven't tested the spirits and you know, you're talking necromancy, talking with saints. Um, you don't have understanding of who Michael the Archangel was. They'll have their knowledge and their religion and what they've been taught and what they believe. And I'll come to you with this big plank, and it's normally this big, full of scriptures, this big plank of argument, talking about a post of yours that's that big, and they'll use this amount of scripture to say, that's wrong. They've got a big plank, you've got a little speck. You said that much, they said that much. And if you enter into them, they've got this big plank of scriptures that they can keep on dropping out planks, and you just say, I don't really believe in that. I really don't want to listen to what you have to say. Thanks for all the scriptures. Have a good day. And they'll say, but this scripture says this and this and this. You enter into them. They'll come planking you with your little thing, with your little thing. And I'll be saying, why? Well, your little thing is just so wrong. And here's this big plankful. So all these guys that call out heresy hunters and like a whole ministry of calling faults and the reason why such, such and such is preaching error and stuff, they've got big planks, religious planks in their eyes. You know, the same thing that they're pointing out, they're so full of themselves. They're so full of religion, false teaching, cessationalist sort of beliefs that there's no prophets, apostles or gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing supernatural today. 
They're so full of that teaching, they'll use 100 scriptures or 150 or 500, no matter how long you talk to them. They've all got, and they've got understandings of all those scriptures and what all those scriptures are. And I use every one of those scriptures to run a knife through you and insult you and tell you how wrecked and how hopeless and so how crazy and how heretic and how how heresy and how full of error and how deceived and how you're a false prophet. No, you scripture after scripture. I tell you, if you read them, if you read them and read that argument with all that scripture, do you know what happened? It makes you back away from your encounter, it makes you back away from your revelation, it makes you start having full of doubt. Well, how could a person with 150 scriptures be wrong? Michael isn't in my house. He's got no authority in my house. He wouldn't even be in my house. He's true. 150 scriptures prove it. You're just a mentally ill, overweight guy who's only got 1,700 visitors on YouTube. And this guy who's got 250,000 subscribers, he says this. And this guy with 200,000 says this. And he says this scripture. And he says this scripture. And he says this scripture. And all these scriptures say you're a fool, an overweight jerk, mentally ill, on disability pension, in government housing. You wouldn't have any idea who you are. You're claiming the prophet, and prophets don't even exist anymore. And this and this and this and this and this. 150 big plank talking about one little post you did. Michael lives in my house. He, he bilocates. He, he's in my house most of the time. I don't personally know, Michael Van Blyman would know this, but I don't know if angels can bilocate and be in two places at once. I know humans can. I know Jesus can. But I don't know if angels can. It would make sense that Michael's in Israel, Michael's in heaven, and Michael's here. Now, I know of a human uh, monk, her testimony, can't quote his name, that was in three places in the flesh at once, ministering in three places. I know a person that was at a Bible study, Jeff Jansen, in his book, one of his books, he was at a Bible study, teaching a Bible study, and walking around a conference doing prophecies hundreds of miles away, at the same time, when he got to the conference the next day after the Bible study, he travelled to the conference. When he got to conference on the second day, not the first day, he had so many people saying thanks for the prophecy last night. The first person who said, I wasn't here last night. He said, yes, you were. You signed this. And here's his signature. Here's his writing saying, bless you. And they signed the book. He said, thank you for signing it. Thanks for your prophecy. He said, how could this happen? I was hundreds of miles from here in another state. I can't be in two places at once, but spiritually can. Now, I don't know if angels can do it, but it would make sense that Michael really isn't in my house all the time. He's also in other places at the same time. That would make more sense to me. But scripturally, unless Michael Van Vleiman wants to comment, then I'm not even care. All I say is he's standing there and he's really there. And I've seen him now, now lots of times up before he started appearing in my house all the time, I'd met him 50 times. I don't know anyone who's met Michael 50 times. I used to question why I'm meeting him so many times. Jesus said it's to build your faith. What it was building was building my faith, building relationship, so that when he turned up full time, I already had a good relationship with him. So sharing that, something precious, to, to God, people who are living a holy life, a set-apart life and a sin-free life or a sinless, a pretty sinless life and a life separate from the world, which is another major part of holiness that the church doesn't understand. When, when you're living a life separated from the world and living for Christ and not for the world, when you're living a life relatively free of sin, you become holy and you're precious to God. So. When, when it's saying don't share your holy stuff with normal people in church, it's saying don't be telling them special revelations or special things. Because if they're like most of the church, they won't receive it. And when you share it on Facebook in a little post like this, all the big people full of judgment with big planks in their eyes and misunderstandings and misteachings and teachings that, that are error will come at you and say, yee, 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 yee. say one little thing, you say one little thing, and I'll say 150 verses, a big plank full. Nobody's on you. Jesus said, first 
get rid of all that wrong doctrine and misteaching. And when you're free of all of that, have another look and see if you can see that speck in their eye. You won't see it anymore. It won't be there. But if there's any error in his teaching, if you get rid of all your error, you may see that you haven't got as big an argument with him. You may be able to see clearly to be able to actually advise him on what little part of what he said is wrong. But the heresy hunters and the dogs and the normal people in the church, they hear about your encounter, like Michael said, or they hear about your revelation, which is totally contrary to what the church has been preaching for 20 years. They come at you with a big plan of scripture, 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 and you're wrong. And all he said is, I think this means this, and Jesus said yesterday. He said, this little revelation, and they give you a whole laundry list of why you're wrong. And who the hell do you think you are? Better than our apostle, our prophet, or the visiting speakers and, and, and the heritage of our denomination that's been running for 30 years and you're thinking you're better than them and you know better? And they'll come out with all the stuff. And they'll come through knives to be saying things, insulting you. And people have these arguments on Facebook and it's like bang, 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 insult, insult. If you don't submit and if you don't agree and if you try and bring a good argument to them, when they start not winning, they start abusing you and insulting you and calling you names. That's what the Democrats are very good at. Can you start uh, arguing logic and wisdom at them and I'll start calling you names. Well, you know, Jesus turned it around on the Pharisee, a bit like Trump. Jesus said, you brood of vipers, right? Well, there's things. That's why I use the vomit, right? When something's mentioned, it seems to have the same, there's a contextual understanding found in another verse with the same word, right? So when it says dogs and swine, when I took it to Peter and talked about dogs and swine, when I took swine to prodigal son, back feeding the swine, you got to better the vomit out of Jesus and the dogs and the swine and the prodigal son going back and the Peter saying that uh, you fall back into the things of the world, uh, then uh, you'll be like dogs and swine. When I showed all that, it showed the contextual understanding of that word or those words. It gives further revelation. This is one of the things in proper biblical and I can't spell the word, I really don't understand what the word is, but the word is exegesis. Right? When you learn to be a great preacher, which I'm not, um, according to the world standard, um, that's good exegesis. It's using the law of first mention, right? Now, normally when a word is mentioned first in the Bible, what it actually means in the context has a primary understanding that's followed through all the scriptures that come with that verse later on. You know, if you want to look at a really deep meaning of the word, look at the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, that'll give you a tremendous understanding of how it's used later on. Well, the first time a snake or a viper is mentioned in the Bible, is when Satan was called a snake, he came into a viper and led the whole world into sin. So when Jesus was saying the Pharisees were a brood of vipers, he was saying, you are Satan. Satan is using you and speaking through you. So, you know, when Trump says, uh, you know, uh, liar Ted or, or crooked Hillary, when he puts that slang nickname on him, it hits them like a viper, right? It's saying every time Hillary speaks, it's crooked. It's like a message, but it's twisted. It's crooked. It's not right. So when he says crooked Hillary, it gets in into your psyche that you can't really trust what Hillary says because it's crooked. When Jesus threw out a name or did name calling, he did it powerfully. He said, you're a brood of vipers. He's saying, you know, your, the law of first mention said that the viper is who Satan spoke through. Jesus was saying, you're a brood of vipers. 
Jesus is saying, Satan is using you to speak. Don't you realize that? Now, you don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. That's a revelation from about three months ago when Jesus showed me that. Right? Do you know a white scepter, you know, a grave is, is like a spectre or whatever, a grave. You're whitewashed a uh, grave and, and you're really clean on the outside. But even the word grave is a real unclean place. You can't be around a dead body or think, uh, uh, even calling them a grave is, is like unclean. But he says all shiny and white on the outside but inside full of dead men's bones, which that's definitely unclean. So he says, you look all nice and polished on the outside, nice and polished up, but you're full of deadness inside. So you're unclean inside. Jesus also said it's not what goes into a body that you follow from men, but what a man comes out of a man that really counts. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're speaking bad stuff and really bad stuff it's coming out of your heart what's inside of you now that pharisees heard jesus say that so when he said you're all nice and polished inside but inside you're dead man's bones you're saying hey you may look good you might sound good but you're full of wickedness and you're a brood of vipers and you're really wicked you're really unclean now when a pharisee was unclean means that he can't go to temple. He's got to go through a 14-day process, a seven-day process, I don't know what it is, had to see the priest and go through this special time where he can't go to the temple. So a, a Pharisee didn't like to ever become unclean. And when you touch the dead, you're unclean. So Jesus is saying, by saying, you know, you're a whitewashed tomb, it's saying basically you're unclean. But what's really unclean about you is what's inside you. And you look nice outside, but inside you're totally unclean and dead. Right? You're not worthy to be in the temple. So when Jesus said that, that was a powerfully hard, powerful, bad rebuke for the Pharisees. What you don't know is Jeremiah or Isaiah, it talks about this um, uh, this uh, thing, this uh, stuff that was taken up with mortar and polished and re, uh, re, re sort of uh, stuff put over it to make it all perfect. It was cracked and was no good and it was broken, but it was totally polished up and made clean and perfect. And Jesus was going back to the mention of that, saying that this is what you really are, but you've put all this mortar on it and made it look good. Jesus was referring him that back to that scripture, saying he's totally wrong. And in that scripture, it says you take what's broken and not working, and you do a remodeling on that and make it look good. But it's not good; it's broken. You've just tempered over it, put your own temper, put your own flesh on it, and uh, made it look good. It's broken. It's no good. It should be thrown out and not used. But you've prettied it up and made it look good. So when Jesus is saying to them, you're a whitewashed tomb and doing this whitewash, it's referring back to this Jeremiah passage, which saying, you're no good, you're broken, it's no good. And yet you've applied this stuff to it and you're starting to think you're good. So Jesus, in one thing, is rebuking really, really hard on multiple levels when he's talking to the Pharisees. But you guys who don't know Jesus, don't understand the scriptures, don't walk in the scriptures, don't obey Jesus, don't do anything for Jesus. You don't understand all these things. That, you know, Trump, is, he just says insult. But when he says them, they hit. When Democrats say me are racist, they've got nothing on me. I am a racist. I don't particularly like the way Chinese push in front of me. prostitutes that I know, that I've talked to, some of them won't even sleep with an Indian. They're very rude, they're very unclean, they smell, they're not hygienic, they're rude, they want to do wicked, sick stuff and they're cheap and they don't spend money. So I love Indians, but I haven't been a prostitute and dealt with Indian guys, but you know, some, a lot of prostitutes, and I've looked at a lot of prostitutes' ads and read a lot of what the, some of them at the bottom of their ads say, no Indians, definitely no Indians, right? So I've asked a couple of prostitutes, what is it about Indians, what's so bad? They come out with all this stuff, right? So 
prostitutes are definitely racist against Indians. I particularly don't like the rudeness and the way Chinese push in. But here's another thing I like about China. Chinese are really hard workers. They work really hard, very diligent, work long hours, and they do their best to try and succeed in my country. But originally, years ago, they used to talk on the bus and the train together, and I used to be a racist Australian who said, you're in my country, speak my language. You know, basically saying, I want to listen in on your conversation. I want to hear if you're talking about me or hear what you're talking about because I don't like Chinese. I don't like you in my country. I don't like you speaking a foreign language. And if you're going to talk, talk in English so I can listen in on what you're talking about. Totally racist. I got a lot better. I still don't like the way they push in on public transport. But I learned from a pastor who went to China and caught trains in China, she said, if you don't push, you don't get on the train. If you don't push hard and be rude about it, you'll just stand all day trying to get on trains. You gotta push and you gotta be hard and you gotta be rude or you just don't get on. So when I heard that pastor say that, I can understand. They're always pushing it because that's all they've ever known. What they don't know after 20 or 30 years living in China is you don't have to push anymore. You can actually get on the train and be nice and Australian about it and English about it and upstanding about it and not push and not push in. But Chinese, they're just pushing on. Well, when you don't understand that, you're racist. I don't like Chinese. They're always pushing in. <laughs> I understood this more. <clears throat> One day a Chinese pushed in front of me going through a turnstile at the station. I said to Jesus, did this used to bug you? And he said it did, but they never knew it. So how did you deal with it? I dealt with it, took it to the thing, forgave him, prayed for him, and went on. But I was asking Jesus, why, why go to someone else when you can go straight to Jesus? So when, when someone with a big plank in their eye has a problem with you and they're losing the argument if you actually take the time to even engage with them. You're foolish enough to engage with them. Solomon said it's no use arguing with a fool, you'll prove yourself a fool. Trying to speak logic to a fool is an act of foolishness. You go through all what Proverbs said and learn about dealing with fools and you'll learn not to talk to people with planks in their eyes, just not even worry about it. If they're full of pride and they think they're right, why are you talking to them? They're not going to, if they think they're right, can use 150 scriptures against you, why do you try and prove your revelation is true and it's really true? They're so set in their ways, they've got such a big plank in their eyes, they can't even be spoken to. So, we're unpacking scripture, but we're taking a long time. <clears throat> so when you've seen revelations, visions, and had encounters, or have some amazing stories, be sure who you share them with. And I know my five people, no matter how long this is, will be listening. And I hope they really get a lot out of this. Now, let's get on to some things. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, receives. Anyone, everyone who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So, use people who want to talk back and forth to Jesus. Right? Use people that want to talk back and forth with Jesus. You know, have two-way conversations, have conversations with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and with the Father, with saints, with angels. Be able to speak, even speak to witches or other Christians telepathically back and forth. And I'm doing that. I'm talking to former witches. I'm talking to witches that I've saved. And I'm talking to other Christians telepathically in my mind. Oh, that's witchcraft. No, that's just what you can do. The whole body of Christ don't need the internet. They can just speak through ether and mind to mind, just like you speak to Jesus. You can speak to another Christian somewhere in the world. And everyone who's a big saint, when they die, 
I have conversations with them straight away. They don't know me before they die. When they go to heaven, they talk about Jesus and they talk about Matthew. And they say, you need to meet Matthew. And they come down to, hi, man, I never knew you, but here you really like him. I'm King Clement, sorry for dying. How are you? Post on Facebook that I'm sad I'm dying, but I'm really enjoying the music in heaven. And if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you'll do that. And you'll be crazy. Someone with a big plank in their arm, you're a necromancy, man. You're speaking to the dead. How dare you do that? Right? So that's an example. So now, if, 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 if you want to speak back and forth to Jesus, back and forth to the Holy Spirit, back and forth to the Father, like Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I call them out by name and they follow me and they do what I do. And if they know that voice of the shepherd, they will not let a robber teach them anything. Anyone who wants them to enter other than the sheepfold, and if they don't recognise the voice, I'm the doorway. Everyone who enters enters through me. Uh, my voice say no and they recognise they won't listen to the voice of a stranger. Do you know why you get deceived and led astray by false teachers and false prophets? Not because you're stupid, because you can't recognise the Holy Spirit's voice. Can't recognise Jesus' voice. So when Jesus is speaking through a person, you don't know it because you've never heard Jesus' voice before. You don't know what it sounds like. Now, when Jesus is teaching his, his sheep hear his voice, that's what a shepherd used to do. In Australia, they used dogs and, and, and motorbikes to round up sheep. But in Jesus' day, a shepherd used to call Peter, John, Mary, Elizabeth, Dundee. All the sheep had names. Andy. All the sheep had names. Andy, get out of there. Come back here. Right? They understood English. Hey, Andy, come back. The sheep responded to the voice. When the shepherd with five sheep or 100 sheep or 20 sheep, you know, we know that some shepherds could have 100 sheep because Jesus left 99 and went after the one. But when the sheep had all these sheep, he'd say, come on, follow me, right? Turn around and say, if one of them wasn't following, he said, Mary, come on, follow me. That's how a shepherd used to do it. That's how a rabbi used to say when when you know, he trained all his students and he picked the very best students, how they'd find out they passed and they're going to be indentured into being a rabbi, they'd go along to the best students and say, Mary, follow me. Dundee, follow me. John, follow me. When I'm talking about three of my friends that are on my same page that watch all my videos, but that's how a rabbi used to do. He At the end of two years training and all the scripture and memorising the first four books of the Bible and doing all these Jewish customs and becoming like a great, uh, you know, Jew and having a bar mitzvah and becoming official man in a Jewish custom, had to be able to uh, quote uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, had to be able to quote all of those verses word for word those four books. Now, I challenge any Christian to be able to do that, but any Jew could. And they knew a lot of the Proverbs and Psalms and Jews knew heaps, right? Heaps more, you know, want to have an argument, go and have an argument with a Jew. They can quote the whole New Testament, Old Testament sometimes. A Pharisee could quote the whole Old Testament, right? They knew everything. So you want to talk to plank in the eyes, guys, right? talk to a Jew, man, and start bringing new revelation to a Jew. No use 5,000 scriptures to argue you. Jesus brought a new teaching. It was called a new yoke. Take my yoke upon you because it's easy. I'm, I, I'm, I'm lowly and beautiful and, and bring rest to your souls. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is what... a uh, 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 Yoke is a form of teaching, form of understanding that a rabbi used to teach. We're getting quite off, but I still, Holy Spirit knows what we're doing. So a rabbi used to teach the teachings and the understandings of the rabbi that taught him. And for hundreds of years, rabbis would be teaching what their master taught. But from time to time, not very often, 
a rabbi would come with total new revelation, new understandings, and a new up-to-date look at the old scriptures in a new way that brings revelation and fresh understanding to the modern people of that day. There was a parable in Jesus. Uh, parables were talked about a scribe. A scribe was someone who took the old, added the modern revelation, and brought the old, not disagreeing with the old, but brought new understanding to the old, so it's fresh and it's rima and it's a word for today. A good teacher is like a scribe. I'm a scribe. I can bring what's there, old, 2,000 years, bring it relevant, make it sound really relevant. So I'm a scribe. I've actually got a scribe angel called Bethany. Right? So that's what a scribe used to bring the old, update it, bring it relevant, speak it to the modern people with a new revelation, bringing a new yoke, a new form of teaching, not what's been taught for the last 200 years, but something new, fresh and relevant to today's society. That was a scribe. But when a rabbi did that, not a scribe, scribes used to dictate and say what the word of God was saying and used to copy uh, the word of God and do a whole lot of things. <laughs> Most prophets in the Old Testament had someone who wrote, it was a scribe, who wrote down their words because a lot of people couldn't write, weren't literate. Right? So the prophet used to hear it, the scribe used to write it. You know? So Kat Kerr calls herself, said that her books were, dictated by a scribe angel and he said this message right an angel gave her the message and a scribe angel wrote the introduction well big deal great scribe right that's what a scribe is but when a rabbi was bringing an up-to-date new message a message that hadn't been heard before that was called a new yoke and very rare was a rabbi did that but jesus says a rabbi was saying i've got a new yoke right and it was controversial and he had all the planks guys arguing hundreds of scriptures saying, you can't say that. So that's why Jesus said, it, it said, um, you know, uh, uh, do unto others as that they do unto you, right? <laughs> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the Pharisees uh, had, had a law that you could repay your enemies with wrath. You could treat them like they treated you. So that's why they asked Jesus, who's my enemy? Who is my neighbor? Because they want to see if they're okay because they're allowed to punch their enemies back. Like Trump, Trump counterpunches. Someone hits him, hits them back. Well, the Pharisees, under their taught law, said that if someone is their enemy and they hit them, they can hit them back. Whatever they do, you can hit back hard as sin. So you hit Israel, God hits you. You divide Israel, God hits you. doesn't matter if you're in America, it doesn't matter who you are. Whoever attacks Israel gets hit by God. Still, still, every time they've had major thing happen in the state, because they divided or did some sort of peace treaty to Israel, that will continue even if Trump divides Israel, America will get hit hard, and there's a whole book about that. So the Pharisees believe you could hit hard anyone who had proven to be your enemy. So Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and do good to your enemies. And by doing good, Paul said, by doing your enemy favours, it'd be like doing hot coals up their head. Right? People think if you do good to your enemies and treat them a whole lot, it's like torturing them. That's a whole other thing, and I'll speak about that but I won't speak about it now so a rabbi when he was finished Jesus had a new yoke that's why he was always having trouble with Pharisees because they all had plank eyes and 5,000 scriptures to argue with part of the reason Jesus was saying hey you think I've got a problem take your big plank out of your eye he was talking to his guys that he's teaching that he's following him people on his same page he's talking about to us today, and you have got no understanding of what he's teaching there, and he's teaching the Pharisees, speaking to the Pharisees who are sitting there listening, and he's bringing a new yoke, and he's saying, hey, guys, stop coming to me with your 50,000 scriptures saying I'm wrong. Take your bullshit out of your head and learn my new yoke, right? This is the new yoke. It used to be said, hit your Pharisees back foot, but I say, no, forgive them, pray for them, love them, and Paul actually said, Treat them so nice that your enemy will become your best friend. And I'll share it right here because I've mentioned it and you wonder what's happening, so I'll share it. 
Paul was saying in, in the Jewish, ancient Jewish, you hear this thing, if you keep on listening all your life and instead of thinking you know the best, you actually hear things and remember them. In the ancient Jewish vi village around Jesus' time, sometime, well, every night a person used to stay up and keep a fire, keep all the embers burned, burn a big fire and get a whole lot of coals, right? Keep on putting wood on, have a whole lot of hot coals. In the morning, he put an urn on his head, like you see women in Africa carrying water and stuff on a metal urn, right? He put a metal urn full of hot coals on his head and walk around, take it off and spoon some hot coals into every woman's fire in the morning and start the fire. So they didn't have to flint and wood and do all this stuff, starting a fire from nothing. They could get a hot coal, put some paper or something on it, uh, put some sticks on it and start their fire. So if, if you treat your enemy, feed your enemy, bless your enemy, feed him, give him water. If he's thirsty and if he's hungry, if you treat him really good, you can turn him, him into a person who will stay up all night, tend the fire and bless your whole village every morning. So people say, I'm going to treat someone really nice and bless my enemy and that'll be hot coals over the head. So when they have a big Facebook fight with you and use their plank in 150 scriptures and you start making an argument with them, engage them, start moving in supernatural wisdom, making them look foolish, a foolish person you are, you're coming out with all this wisdom. When they start losing the arguments, they start calling your names, getting really nasty and saying really nasty things. At the end of it, they say, bless you. Because you're their enemy and they're identifying you as their enemy. They think you're the enemy. You're arguing with them. You won't come around to their prideful ways and listen to things that their 150 scriptures definitely preach. You're so full of pride and so stupid, you won't come over to their argument. It's su such a fool. They've insulted you and through the thing you've become enemies, what they perceive as an enemy. Their enemy is someone who don't listen to them, don't do what they say. So at the end of it, they say, God bless you, right? Because Jesus says, bless your enemies, right? So they're saying, God bless you. In other words, saying, you're my enemy, you're a total jerk. Jesus says, to bless you, bless you. Just pulled off all these insults, calling you all sorts of names and running knives through you, thinking you're a dog and they're running knives through you, sharing revelation. They share 150 verses why your revelation is wrong. If you've actually been mistaken like me in years past and actually engaged in this sort of stuff, at the end of it, after 150 posts on Facebook or YouTube, they'll say, bless you. Because Jesus said, bless your enemies. But that's not what blessing your enemies is. And giving a drink and feeding your enemy isn't pouring hot coals in the head. The dominant Christian teaching is by blessing them, treating them really nice, you're going to torture them. Well, that's totally stupid. Why would, it, why would you really bless your enemy in order to torture him? But that's what's taught. That's what people believe. So that's why I say bless you. I think by finally being nice to you is going to bring you torture. I think they bless you is like F you at the end. They think that's what it is. By blessing you, they're going to put torture on you. Um, another thing is Jesus said, bless your enemies, pray for your enemies. So they say bless you and they go praying for you. But they've just called you 1,500 curse words, called you all sorts of false prophet, false teacher, heretic, and all those sort of words, right? Name calling, Democrat name calling. But Trump doesn't waste his words. He doesn't call me a racist. I am a racist. Uh, I, I am a homophobic. I've got a problem of homosexuals having sex up the anus. They're not created to do that. And I've got a problem of a male having sex at a woman's anus. He's a sodomite and he's pretty sick too. And any man that asks his wife to do that or girlfriend to do it, sick. And any guy doing that to another, sick. And it's all the same. It's sick. So if you call me a homophobe by saying that's not natural, I am. I am a homophobe. And if bigot is my Christian values actually say that your culture and your values are wrong. If biblically what I do is right and biblically what they're doing is wrong, I am a bigot. I am a racist and I am homophobic. So none of it hurts me because really 
doesn't worry me because that's what I am, according to them. But when Jesus calls you a viper, it hits hard. Because that's calling you Satan in a person. When Trump calls you crooked Hillary, that hits hard. Because that's saying you can't trust anything. You can't, you know, um, Trump is actually calling Hillary a viper and Satan because vipers have, snakes have a crooked tongue. So he's saying when, when Hillary speaks, she's demon speaking. Satan is a viper speaking. That's Satan in Hillary, crooked Hillary. Right, you know, the ancient Indians say white men speak with crooked tongue. In other words, Hillary's saying, uh, Trump is saying that Hillary is that she's a viper, she's Satan. The, the ancient Americans, uh, Indians, used to white men speak with wickedness, they say one thing and do another, just like the Christian church, just like the Pharisees, just like people who've got big plants with 150 scriptures who know it all, right? So let's get back to the point. If you want to talk to Jesus, well, here's, here's, we left off the point. So when you've been finally approved by the rabbi, he'd come up to you like Mary, Dundee, Andy, John, and Elizabeth. He'd say to the five best students that really listening to him, applying everything he does and growing and learning and proving themselves, he says, follow me. In other words, when a rabbi says that to you, it means he's going to pay your food, he's going to give you accommodation, he's done it, going to totally support you and teach you how to be a rabbi. So when Jesus went around saying to people like Peter and all these people saying, follow me, he was dressed like a rabbi. He looked like a rabbi. Had glory coming off him that would turn your head and wonder what's coming up the road. So glory. He'd walk up, do a teaching and say, follow me. Man, they'd drop everything because all they wanted to do was be a rabbi. They're hungry. Jesus wasn't picking idiots. He was picking the most hungry guys. Right? He didn't give a flying hoot that Judas was going to betray him. He needed Judas. He picked Judas. It was... Judas actually thought he wanted everything like that. And when you get to the truth of the matter, Judas only really betrayed Jesus, not so much for the money. He betrayed Jesus to force Jesus' hand, to make Jesus actually fight and stand up and be the Messiah, not lay down and be crucified. So when you understand that, you can understand sort of in the mind of Judas. And so many people try and force Jesus' hand. Well, that's what most people do. When they're doing fasting, they're trying to grab Jesus' hand and force his hand. They fast for 30 days because they want something, sort of forcing Jesus into doing it. Can't do that with fast. So when a shepherd used to say, Mary, follow me, come on, sheep, follow me, it was a shepherd saying, hey, come with me. Now, if you weren't coming with me, he'd call you by name. He'd say, Mary, come on. Right? You knew your name. You know if you were called by name, you paid attention because you recognise your shepherd, you recognise your name. So when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I call you by name and you follow me, he's saying that my sheep, number one, know my voice. Number two, know that I'll call them by name. And number three, they know that my sheep, if I call them by name and they do what I tell them to do. Now, Jesus, scripture, Christians use all the same, but that Jesus doesn't lose anyone that Father has given him. But that's at the end of the passage. If you can't hear Jesus, if you can't hear your name being called, and you don't listen and follow Jesus, those three things, you're not a sheep. Because his sheep hear his voice. His, his sheep don't read the word of God. His sheep hear his voice. Hear his voice. Not read his voice. Hear his voice. A shepherd would do no good reading the word of God to his sheep. A shepherd would say, follow me, and I'd all follow. And anyone out of line, he'd say, Mary, follow me. Come on. And she'd buck in and do it right. 
right? So when they say, no one that the Father has brought to me that will lose, and you can't lose your salvation because no one is lost, Jesus saves everyone. No, he only saves his sheep. If you're like 90, 80% of Christians and you can't hear Jesus, there's a good chance you're not his sheep. Right? You've got to learn to be able to hear his sheep. And you can be worried about false teachers and false pe teaching and heresies and all sort of uh, false teachings that lead many astray, leading even the elect into error. You don't have to ever worry about that if you know Jesus' voice and you're his sheep. And another verse about sheep and goats, because it's mentioning the same word, remember, when it mentions sheep and the goats, the goats do all these bad things, don't do all this, don't visit people in prison, don't go to hospitals, don't feed the hungry, don't give drinks to the home, the thirsty, don't um, uh, put clothes on the people with no clothes. When have you ever walked down the street and seen someone with no clothes? You don't see that. So who are these people who need clothes? Homeless people have been in clothes for three months and their clothes are all black and stink. Right? That's a homeless person. That's a person with no clothes. Go and take him and buy some clothes for him. You can't take him to a normal shop because a lot of them are overweight or like me or, you know, they're messy and stinky and stuff. You'd have to worry about that. So if you want to give a person with no clothes clothes, Take a homeless person and go and buy him $300 worth of clothes. Make him feel better out in the street. But took, took those, the strangers in, right? That word strangers in a different interpretation is homeless people. So in other words, if you're doing the sheep and the goats, you put homeless people in your place. If you've got a couch, you'll take a homeless person in, feed them, look after them, and help them get on their feet so they live inside and not outside anymore that's what the sheep do now i can say well do that that's, that's really being a sheep i've done that three times taking homeless people in into my two bedroom unit and helped them and each of them have lived with me for more than a year each so i don't talk about things i don't do that's why you like me that's why my friends like me because i'm authentic and i do it and I confess things that I do wrong. So first of all, if you want to learn how to hear Jesus and become, well, first of all, if you do all the things the sheep do in the sheep and the goats parable, you're a sheep. If you don't do those things, you're a goat. So when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, here's two things. They do all the things the sheep do in the sheep parable, Sheep and the goats, and if you're one of my followers, you know what that is. And here's another thing is sheep. If you're a sheep, you hear his voice. If you're not hearing his voice, and you're not doing the sheep and the goats parable, you can lose your salvation and go to hell. You're actually, you're not a sheep, you're a tear. Whoa, you know, what's this? Yeah, that's right. There's two lots of people. There's the good crop and there's the bad crop. The enemy sowed in, tears. We're well, getting some understanding here, all going around sheep and stuff, right? Then we're moving from sheep to sheep and Ted. You're not a sheep, you're a Ted. And what's that? It's so this great ground of good, good stuff. And then the enemy came in during the night and filled up that plot where all the good seed is with a whole lot of false seeds, seeds that sprout into something that look like wheat. But when it comes to the harvest, there's no fruit on the tear. But you don't know what the tear and the wheat look like until harvest time. When it's harvest, all the wheat have got fruit and all the tear have got no fruit. So the only difference between a tear and a wheat is harvest. When the harvest is there, is fully mature, it's time to grow. That parable says they'll gather up the angels, will cover it, gather up all the tares, all the ones with no fruit, and throw them into fire, which is eternal life in hell. Right? Now, you definitely won't want to be a tear, will you? Of 
because you definitely, if you're going to church and praying prayers and reading your Bible and going to two meetings a week and paying your tithes, you definitely wouldn't want to be an F and tear, would you? Right? <laughs> definitely. Definitely not. But the problem is, if you're not hearing from Jesus, you're not hearing from the Holy Spirit, and you're not doing what the sheep and the goats are, you are a tear. You're a false convert. You're not even saved. I don't care if you said a 15-minute sinner's prayer. I don't care what you do. Don't care. John 15 says this. Those who, my, my father is the vine dresser and, 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 and I am the vine. And when my father sees someone doing good fruit, he prunes it so it bears more fruit. So what you get as a Christian, uh, if you're doing a good job, you get prune, 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 prune. Hurt, 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 hurt. Persecution, 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 persecution. Troubles, trials, 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 trials. All of these things build character, produce more fruit. Now I'm so anointed, man. I can just speak for hours about singing. I can't even finish the sermon until Holy Spirit tells me. So anointed, so much full of revelation. So here you are. If you want to hear from God, if you want to talk back and forth, if you want to go from being a tear to a fruit, if you want to go from being a goat to a sheep, and I'll tell you, most of the church are tears and most of so-called believers have got no fruit. Now, how, how can I say they've got no fruit? Well, John 15 continued, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in the vine. Those who abide in the vine bear much fruit. And those who do what I say and abide in the vine, they produce a lot of fruit. When you abide, everything you ask for, you'll get. Right? But the t people who bear no fruit, they're caught off and thrown into the fire. Definitely don't want to be one of those people bearing no fruit, do you? Because you don't want to go to the fire, and the fire is the same word. The tares go to the fire. The people that bear no fruit go to the fire. So when Jesus is teaching the parables of the soil, he said the first soil falls on stony ground, the birds take it. Right? Listen, an apostle, I use, I use what other people teach, right? If I've got this in my hand, right, and I'll give you this revelation, right, you got to, you know, if i got it here and Satan comes to steal the revelation, right, he's got to pull harder than you, man. He doesn't get that revelation off you if you don't want it to go. So if you've got doubts, if you don't believe it, if you haven't got enough ground in you, I can share a revelation It can pull out. This isn't salvation. This is everything in the Bible. This is every revelation. This is every verse in the Bible. This isn't talking about being saved. Right? This is talking about the Word of God. So if I teach the Word of God to you and you say, he's an overweight manic depressive bipolar guy living on the mental illness in a government house and he thinks michael's in his house he's a total whack job good satan can take it give it to him he can say all that's bs that's all bullshit he thinks we got planks he's got so many planks in his eyes he doesn't know what he's doing i'm going to call him a heresy i'm going to teach him preaching heresy he's a heretic he's a false teacher false prophet and all sorts of names right but if you've got a revelation it doesn't matter if the birds come satan the bird the master of the skies the rule of the air it doesn't matter if the rule of the airs come the birds the birds right doesn't matter if he comes and tries to steal if you like that revelation if you believe that revelation is going to bear fruit in your life you hold on to it now that's the first one the second one is was the one in shallow ground right well these are the people that ha don't have much foundation don't have much teaching don't have much understanding in them when i teach this word that I'm going to have some more apple juice in a sec. See, it's my stack of apple juices. I ran out of milk, so I can't have coffee. Now I'm onto my apple juice. And if I run out of apple juice, then I've got to go down to the gas station, get some more milk so I can have more coffee. Ah, coffee. So, so, 
The second one is one that doesn't have a lot of foundation, doesn't know much of the Word of God, couldn't know enough Scripture to even understand what I'm teaching here, don't even know the Scriptures I'm sharing, never heard the Scriptures that I'm sharing. I'm referencing Scriptures and parables all over the place. They don't know any understanding of them. If someone's new, they don't know these words. Every time I bounce off scripture and not use scripture references and just talk about the scripture, and not using references, they can't understand this message, right? They haven't got much foundation, man. If I'm teaching a revelation and they haven't got much foundation in the word, they hope they like it. They hope it's good. They hope it's true. But when Satan comes in and tests it, through tribulation, hey, you heard this guy. He said, you know, you're not a sheep if you don't hear Jesus' voice. And if you don't hear Jesus' voice, you can be taken away. You be a Christian and go to hell. And if you're not bearing fruit, you're a tear. And you've been sown by the enemy. It doesn't matter if you said the sinner's prayer, you go to church, you do religious things, you speak in tongues, you do all these things, you're still a tear and still going to hell. Now, this guy taught this. Oh, man, he's crazy. Sinners can't lose the hell. You know, uh, you know, no one that's given to Jesus can be taken. Yeah, he spoke about that too, man. He, he said, if you're not a sheep, you can be stolen. You're not, if you're not a sheep, you know, none of the sheep are taken. But if, if you're not doing all these things, if you're not experiencing all these things, then you're not a sheep and you can be taken. You're not really a sheep. If you're not really a sheep, you can be taken because you never were heats. Right? So he said that. Well, you can't do that. Well, watch the video. The guy who's come along said, man, you're trying. What else did he say? And they'll remember most of what you can say when a one hour or two hour message or something. They'll come up with 15 or 20 minutes worth of things. Everything they come up with, the guy will have five scriptures with big planks in his eyes saying that guy's a total lunatic, you know. Well, you said he's bipolar, you said he's mental, as you said, Blumen Michael lives in his house. You said that, you know, people call him a fool. You know, he is a fool. He's crazy, man. He's teaching heresy. That's not the truth because it's a revelation. It's a powerful revelation. This is a powerful teaching. You're understanding a lot of things. And those five people who love me, we're going to have to invest a lot of time in this one because we haven't finished. So, so. When that person who doesn't know all these references I'm quoting and backing things up with, when they hear a revelation, they haven't got a ground in the word. So when testing comes, like a jerk comes and says that this guy doesn't have a good, doesn't take it, I'm not going to watch a two-hour video to see if he's right. Man, I've heard enough. This is BS. This guy, stay away from him, right? So you know what he does? The revelation goes. He stays away from Matthew, stays away from that heretic, takes the advice of the more disciplined Christian who's only heard 15 minutes of a two-hour preach, and he takes his advice and the revelation goes. So this revelation does never bear fruit. Right? Second way. I'm getting to the third way. The third way talks about how the thorns choke out the wheat. What are the thorns? Well, people who've got the thorns are worried about the cares of this life and the deceitfulness. I couldn't remember this, but now the Holy Spirit's helping me. And the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word. In other words, your care for the best car, the best house, the best Prada, the best clothes, the best machines, the best iPads, the best iPhones, the best technology, the best DVDs, the best entertainment, the best bloody this, the best bloody that, the best bloody this, the best bloody that, the best bloody this. And now some of you are offended because they're using the bloody word, right? Bloody this, bloody this, bloody this. Got to have all of this, right? All of this. All of this. The latest movie, the latest gadget, the latest thing. Not just clothes, but the brands, the best, the Nikes, the Pradas, the, all the things. Not just computers, but the Apples and the Macs and the iPhones and the blooming this. All the best, right? I own the best, Mac. There. I own the second best, Android, phone. I own a computer, a phone, and a big TV. That's all I own. Right? Clothes, nothing. I can leave everything. I can, I can do my ministry walk out of my house with my phone and my computer 
I can tether my computer off that. I can run my ministry from everything. I can walk away from my whole life in 10 minutes and not have a problem with it. Just wouldn't have professional videos like this looking so good. And, uh, you know, it'd be nice if I could take some of my clothes. But anyway, I could pack a bag and be gone in 10 minutes if I was told. Most of you can't do that, right? So they're so busy with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. In other words, they're spending all their money having the pleasures of the world that they bear no fruit. It chokes out the world. In other words, they're covetous. They've gone back into the world and they're eating their vomit and they're in the pig pen being messy again. They've got saved out of it. Then they come into church and they talk bullshit. They've gone back into the world and they've become worse. We talked about that. So people like that, most of the church are in that position. They've got no fruit. Now, if you're in that position, you five people are, but a lot of people who are listening to this in years to come are in that position if you're in the church. Now, if you're in that position, you're a tear. If you're in that position, when the harvest has come, because you've got no fruit, you'll go to hell. If you've got no fruit, according to John 15, you're going to go to hell. If you're into the things of the world and serving the world, James 4.4 4 says you're a hypocrite and you're an enemy of God. If you're serving the things of the world, John 1 John 2, 15 to 17, a favourite verse of mine, it says you can't love the world or serve the things of the world. This is not the love of the Father. But the only one that makes the Father happy is the people that do what the Father teaches. And the Father likes you serving kingdom and doing everything Jesus taught. If you're not doing that, you're not pleasing the Father. And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness is doing the opposite of what Jesus taught. Everything Jesus taught, taught you how to do life right. If you disobey what Jesus teaches, you practice lawlessness. When you do sin and you love to do sin, you practice lawlessness. If lawlessness is covetousness, coveting, uh, Ten Commandments sin and the sin in the New Testament that Paul says will take you to hell. If you're doing that, if you're full of the world, the cares of the riches, the deceitful riches, you're going after um, all the best of the world and you love your money and you're lukewarm and you're serving the world and it's lust and you're a friend of the world, James 4.4 4 says you're an enemy of God. And if you're serving the world and all the things of the world, these are not of God but of Satan and not of the Father, John 1 John 2, 15 to 17 says, if you're doing all this, you're not bearing fruit, you're unfruitful, you're going to be cut off according to John 15 and thrown into the fire. Or Jesus said, you're going to be vomited out and he's not going to get his vomit back. Now, here's the thing, because there's been no people getting thrown into the fire, because there's been no obvious vomiting, Okay, you don't think you're going to be vomited. You don't think you're going to be cut off. You're thinking that's at the end of the age. Well, if you're living in 30 years' time when the harvest has come, right, you'll be thrown into the fire if you're all those things. Right? If you're living in... in a few years' time, when God just starts judging the church, you'll experience vomit. You'll experience being totally rejected and having a really bad life as a Christian, not about Jesus. But because no one's been vomited and no one's been thrown into the fire, they think, well, that's not happening. That's not true. God doesn't do that. And most of the Christian church don't believe that you can go to church pray prayers, move in the anointing, move in signs and wonders, be a powerful Christian, go to hell. But Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. You have practiced lawlessness. We did signs and wonders. We prophesied in your name. We did miracle signs and wonders. 
How dare you say this? He said, depart from me. I never knew you, you practice laws. I don't know the order of that. But here is a sign wandering prophesying people, casting out demon people, who are sent to hell. Right? And for years, for 16 years, I listened. Who are those? 16 years. I asked my mum, who are these people? Well, they can't be Christian. You can't be son and not a son. You're always a son, even if you're disobedient. You're still a son. And she said, and no one the Father has given me, have I cast her. If you come to Jesus, by no means you'll be cast out. So yes, she used to use the sheep and the, the sheep uh, parable, one that I've just gone through to argue my argument, but... One day God showed me the context of that. Jesus, Holy Spirit, one of them, showed me the context that I shared and they're not even a sheep. Then he showed me sheep and sheep and the goat, not even a sheep. Only a sheep won't get cast out, but goats can. Do you know, here's the funny thing about sheep and goats. A sheep's got an intuition and knows it's going to be killed. So you can't get sheep walking up the thing of an abattoir where they're going to cut their heads off and kill them. You can get sheep walking up to be sheared because spiritually they know they're just going to get the hot wool cut off and they sort of want that in the summer, right? But when you start walking sheep up to the abattoir, because you don't carry them, you have them walk, right? When you try and get the sheep going up to the abattoir, they won't go. But sheep will follow the leader. So do you know what they do? I don't know if you know this. In Australia, they do this, right? You know what they do? They put a goat in front. And if the goat, because he's stupid, he's got no intuition, he's not smart, he's not spiritually inclined, if the goat walks up straight into death, all the sheep will follow because they follow the leader. They're pretty dumb, pretty stupid, and they follow Right? So if you get an effing goat in front leading the sheep, the sheep will all move into death. So here's the thing. When Jesus said, it's amazing, I can't believe I'm speaking with this anointing and revelation just popping all over the place. I'm trying to finish my teaching and I can't finish. I want to finish. My flesh wants to finish, but the spirit wants to go on. So, so here's the thing. So Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, well, the leader and all the people following will end up in a ditch. Here's the thing. The more I've learned about Christianity, the more I've realised that they're not teaching the truth. In a whole lot of goats or blind are leading the sheep into debt. Now, if you're teaching prosperity, if you're teaching that you can have a covetous lifestyle, be uh, totally consumed in the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, if you're teaching like Benny Hinn did for years and years and years, teach that, that God blesses that, and teaches that if you give me a thousand dollars, God will give you tenfold back and teach all that BS that goes on it. And Hillsong teaches it, and all these mega churches teaches this BS, right? If you're teaching that, you, the goat, teaching covetousness, not teaching the truth, you, the goat, and all your followers, the sheep, all walk into a ditch. Well, one way to call a ditch is you know, Jeremiah was thrown in the well, and if you're thrown down there, someone's got to pull you out, right? But another way of looking at it, and my friend John said this to me today, if you lived on a house and all these sheep started walking off a cliff, would the loving thing be going, stand in front, say, hey, don't go off here? If people blindly were following their leaders and walking off a cliff, the loving thing to do 
even if you're rude and obnoxious about it, is to say, don't walk off here, it's a cliff. But sheep will walk one after the other off a cliff. Do you know that? If you get a goat out in front and you get the goat to walk off, all the sheep, one by one, will drop into death. A person had a vision of heaven, right, one time. I heard, I'm not going to quote a reference for this, but a person had a vision of heaven. There was two lines. There was this big line, like a Hillsong conference, like a mega church conference. All these people line up outside for an hours and hours. And because the line is so big, when Hillsong conference opens, everyone pushes in really rudely. It doesn't matter if you got there first. If you don't push the most, you don't get in first, right? So Christians are like that. So there was two lines, a big one with heaps of people all waiting to get in, all anxious to get in. Then there was another line with just a few people in it that were totally relaxed and totally peaceful. This door with all the people were busting to get in. This door here, they were totally relaxed, not at peace, not worried, because there's hardly any people in that line. He saw the vision, the doors opened. The big line of people all fought and fought with each other, busting to get through the door to be the first in. And they all fell off into hell. Right? Then the line with few people just casually walked in, totally in peace, and walked into heaven. Well, how the hell does that work? Where does that relate? Sheep and the goats parable. The same thing. God put the sheep on one side, the goats on the other. People say, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was blind, I was homeless, I was without clothes, I was in hospital, I was in prison. And you fed me and you did this and you did it. They said, when did we do this? We never seen you. We know what you look like. We never saw you homeless. We never saw you begging. We never saw this. We never saw, we never saw you. They're arguing with Jesus saying, we never did this, man. We know what you look like. We never did this to you. They're arguing that they don't deserve to be in this line. But they're saying, hey, I did nothing special. I never saw you. I never did this. I don't agree to this. Jesus says, oh, no, no, no. Whatever you did to anyone, you did unto me. Not the least of my brethren. Brethren in Jesus, everyone's brothers, everyone's brothers and sisters under Adam and Eve. So brethren doesn't have to be Christian. Brethren is most preferably a, a, a Muslim or a witch or someone, right? So, so in the Good Samaritan, he said, who is my brother? Because the Jews wanted to know, you treat your brother well, but you treat your enemy sing. So they wanted to know, who is my neighbour, right? Neighbour, right? They wanted to know, who's my enemy and who's my brethren, my neighbour. Right? So Jesus taught that Good Samaritan, which was a bastard person, picked up a Jew, which is abhorrent to the Jew and abhorrent to the Samaritan, and he took the Jew home. In other words, your brother, your brethren, your neighbour, can be someone of a total opposite faith, not believing in what you believe in, right? So that clears up. Whatever you did to the least of my brethren, anyone, you did unto me. Now, similarly, what you did to anyone, what you didn't do to anyone, you did to Jesus. So if I could sum up the Christian church and the Christian people that I've met, I'll be nice about this, but I'll be really serious. I'll be serious. If I summed up 95% of Christians, they were goats. 95% of the Christians I have met are goats. Only 5% of Christians are extraordinary. The way to test them is tell them you need $20 to pay a bill. And 9 out of 10 Christians won't give you $20. You could actually ask a hundred, only about two of them would offer to give you the two, the twenty dollars. So anyway, we digress. So when Jesus teaches, wide and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and few find it, and narrow and difficult is the path that leads to life. 
and few find it, people are mistaught that that's the world and that's the split in the world. Well, how could the narrow church be 2 billion Christian and the broad and wide is the path be 4 billion? 4 billion versus 2 billion isn't broad and one third isn't narrow and difficult. So it can't be the world. Logically, it can't be the world. It's got to be like a 95, 5%. It's got to be a 98, 2% split. So if it is, that's really scary. Because if it really is just talking about the Christians and the people listening to him that day, if Jesus was really teaching that to the people listening, and he was saying, only 2 to 5% of you are going to make it in. That's really.